Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for affording me uh, the opportunity to come and uh, spend a little bit of time with you uh, to talk about uh, the work that we're doing at Montrose around transfer transforming frontline service delivery, uh, but also to share uh, topically some of the work uh, and the impact of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, uh, which launched uh, around Australia on 1 July of this year. So, uh, Lisa, my name's Anthony Ostenbrook, and if anyone's struggling with the pronunciation, I hope that's a little bit clearer. Today, I wanted to give you a sense of the journey that we've been on uh, over the last two years or thereabouts uh, about uh, uh, transforming Montrose uh, and moving it from an organisation very much in a charity model to one that can respond to the dynamic change environment uh, that the organisation now faces. But before I started, I wanted to give you a little of the history and the story of Montrose. Uh, the gentleman on the screen, uh, his name is George Marchant, and he's responsible uh, for the organisation we have today. Uh, Montrose was founded in 1933 uh, in response to the global polio epidemic uh, that was then causing uh, much injury, much concern and, uh, uh, and disability uh, to kids right around uh, Australia and the world. And uh, Mr. Marchant uh, and, his, uh, and his wife were good enough to, uh, uh, to get together, collaborate uh, and help with the formation uh, of Montrose, or uh, as it was then known, the uh, Society for Crippled Children and he donated uh, his, um, I'll say his home at Turinga, but I guess it was more like a mansion. Um, and the, the home ha uh, was named Montrose, and that's where uh, the organisation's name comes from today. Uh, as thankfully polio, uh, a vaccine was found, and the organisation moved and changed its focus from one around polio to one uh, with a greater focus on physical disability uh, through the 60s. And, as, uh, as, uh, as the organisation changed its focus then, the organisation's continued to grow its focus and now works uh, with children and young people with physical disability, with early childhood, early intervention, and increasingly uh, the market's asking us to respond to autism and we have a growing expertise, growing number of uh, staff with expertise uh, in autism. In putting together today and thinking about what were the key themes that were running through this uh, for me? I couldn't get away from change. And I found these two quotes that I felt really helped uh, form a view as to, uh, as, to, uh, as to what the challenges that Montrose have been facing and, uh, and how we might share those with you. So first from George, George Bernard Shaw, uh, those that can't change their minds cannot change anything. To me, this is about mindset and mindset's really important. And then secondly, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. That's a real reminder to me that whilst we're focused on our customers and our community and what we can do, uh, we can't actually deliver that unless we change to be in a position to deliver that. So I hope those, those, two, res those two quotes resonate with you. I felt that was a great way uh, and a great inspiration to me and our team uh, around the change journey that we've been on and where we need to position it. In thinking about change and defining that change, uh, Montrose has faced real substantial challenges and they're a combination of factors that have been evolving uh, that we'd have no control over and, and then also a number of ones uh, that we did have within our purview and our grasp. Uh, Lisa mentioned in her introductory comments the National Disability Insurance Scheme and I know everyone in this room uh, will be familiar with elements of the National Disability, Disability Insurance Scheme, the NDIS. It's a massive social change and uh, as many uh, commentators have said, probably the greatest change uh, in, the, uh, in the healthcare sector since the introduction of Medicare in the 1980s. Uh, it is uh, a change not only for those that have been uh, chronically underfunded and underserviced in disability uh, over decades uh, by giving them much greater access uh, to the therapy, supports, aids and equipment uh, that they need, but also a massive change for providers. And for providers such as Montrose, that, that's, meaning, that's meant moving from and uh, effectively quarterly block funding in advance 
uh, where you went and delivered your outputs and there was generally uh, some accountability around that, but not always a great deal, to being paid based on in each incidence of service that you provide and uh, m moving really from a charity model to one that is a business and actually acknowledging that change and being honest uh, internally that that is the change that the external environment is asking the organisation to make uh, is really uh, square one on the board before you can move on. Montrose also had a number of internal factors that it needed to deal with and sometimes these things are not easy to talk about or, or you wish that they weren't the case or perhaps you think maybe I'll hide in the corner but whilst change is coming from the outside we also need to recognise those factors that are challenging on the inside. For Montrose it, the fact that the organisation has sustained an operating deficit over uh, at least the five year, last five years if not a bit longer. Sometimes the organisation uh, was fortunate enough to receive donations, grants, bequests which covered most of that gap but honestly uh, as we've reflected uh, as an organisation that was uh, perhaps the receipt of good fortune or, or good management over those things but there's still at that point a sustained operating deficit. Uh, we recognised and I mentioned the, the change that the NDIS brings for providers and, and getting paid based on incidents of service. That means being focused on productivity and understanding uh, what we do that generates value for clients, and, but also understanding how we get, how we get paid for that. Uh, addressing a, an historic charity culture of one where organisations, uh, which I, I think I'd fair to say was endemic through the disability sector of us doing uh, our services uh, to our clients uh, to help their lives along a little bit. Uh, to one where we're moving uh, away from a charity culture to one that's really uh, focused uh, uh, around our customers and, and Alice and, and Glenn both talked uh, about the importance of customer focus and I couldn't agree more. To, to really make that shift and understand the importance of that shift. And then finally uh, we were burdened uh, with IT systems that um, I think politely to say they're no longer fit for purpose uh, is one thing I probably could use other words to describe them as well. Uh, so weighing up with those challenges, uh, Montrose, Montrose's response, and I've termed it to develop winning strategy, and perhaps in plain English, transform, transform the organisation, including our frontline service delivery. Some of you might be surprised uh, that that's actually the, the response. You know, you might think, well, what other responses could there be? Could you have cut costs? Yes. Could we have, you know, perhaps been a bit more selective around uh, the staff that we had? Yes. Could we have perhaps focused on a niche and just been comfortable with that? Well, we could have. But when we reflected honestly around how do we fulfil the mission, vision and purpose, if you remember that George March and set out for this organisation, it wasn't to sit in the corner and be, uh, and be quiet. It was really to deliver as much value to the customers uh, that Montrose has the ability to serve. And to do that, uh, we do need to transform, but we need to develop a strategy, but we also need to win. And when I say win, it's not uh, in some sort of macho uh, corporate sense. Uh, it is to say that uh, we can be the best organisation that we can be, we can be sustainable, uh, we can be focused on all of our customers and clients and deliver them the services that they need at the time that they need it uh, and in the, to the extent that they need it. The components of this strategy uh, started to, to take shape uh, over the last 12 months and uh, whilst we see the front of the organisation being the, the, the therapists and, and in-home workers, uh, community access uh, teams uh, and others that we have in the field, uh, we quickly came to the view that uh, in order for those people uh, to do the tremendous work that they do to the best of their ability, we need to get the whole organisation fit and focused uh, and able to do that. And that uh, had a number of components around IT, around real development, uh, uh, starting to develop a customer culture, around understanding workforce planning and capacity, uh, and then also working on our service delivery systems. So perhaps to, to run through each of those, around IT, uh, I don't think any of this I would say is revolutionary, but again, there's a, a level of honesty uh, that needs to be taken uh, around this and, and understanding uh, the, uh, the potential around IT, which uh, our, 
our panel this morning talk to us around how digital might really work into this. So the nuts and bolts of this for Montrose has just been getting a suite of systems corporately that work. Uh, and uh, I know that's been the case for many organisations that have worked in the disability and also the aged care and other sectors as well. In order to do great frontline work, you need to be able to equip your team to do that. They need to know uh, what they're doing, where they're supposed to do it. We need to be able to bill uh, our customers. We need to have a service record to make sure that uh, uh, we've recorded what we've done and we're not having multiple conversations about the same topics. Uh, we need to be able to give uh, access uh, to uh, data that we have to the team in the field, so getting some mobile computing right, being able to, to work through rostering and, and stuff that you might regard as 101, but really important to get it right and even harder to get it integrated and get it right. And then thirdly, thinking about frontline uh, the frontline elements of this and this is where teletherapy uh, for us which is a project uh, that we're about to roll out uh, really would start to use the front end of, of what might be possible under, under the digital, uh, the digital uh, transformation that's coming uh, over the next few years. Uh, being able to, to better link with our customers, particularly those in regional, rural and remote areas on a more frequent basis uh, through teletherapy rather than one that's face to face. It offers not only uh, our customers the opportunity to, to make uh, more progress more quickly, uh, but also uh, it offers uh, for Montrose uh, efficiencies and economies of scale and service delivery which wouldn't otherwise be available. By all means, I don't think that's where it's going to end either. Um, you know, listening to, uh, uh, to the team this morning uh, I don't think it'll be too long before we have the Montrose app. Uh, we will have a client portal that comes through that works with, uh, it gives our, the, uh, gives our uh, customers the ability to interact with us, much in the way that Glenn talked about uh, with, uh, with the ability to chat with clients online. Developing a customer culture are critically important and I think this is the real crux of the change around the NDIS, being able to have a customer focused culture uh, will be so critical to being successful and to winning. And you know what, it's easy to say, but it's really hard to do uh, because it means that you need to change practice in ways that perhaps uh, to, the, to the first point aren't obvious, but, but are really important if you are truly uh, taking that from a, a customer perspective. And I, I was uh, struck at a, at a session uh, that Disability Services Queensland ran last week up in Toowoomba, I was there I had uh, a consumer of NDIS services that were saying, it's so great, I can now get the people, the therapists that I want uh, to work with my child to come to my house on a Saturday morning and I don't need to worry about pulling people out of school. The, thoughts and the thought of actually providing services on a Saturday morning might actually <laughs> cause mild anxiety to uh, some, of the, some of the organisations like ours, but that truly is uh, one, uh, one component of where the future might be for us. I started to imagine where we are now and uh, we're last year in 2015 and where we might be in the year 2020 and to give you a sense of some of the, the, the change that this organisation is working through and, and I'm sure many others as well. Almost doubling the number of frontline staff that we have, opening up multiple new locations, moving from people, uh, from professionals perhaps managing their, their own sense of, of appointments and commitments to one where that might be done by a professional that, uh, that has expertise uh, in scheduling. Moving from a, a standard workday to one that, with extended hours, uh, uh, one where we provided historically government funded limited outreach services where we might see you twice a year, to one where uh, the customer is the customer has choice and control under the scheme and we need to respond uh, appropriately to be relevant. One from where we were providing niche supports to one where people will get the funding that they need to be relevant uh, to their lives. I have three uh, quick service delivery uh, examples to run through with you and uh, before uh, we move to um, the group panel just to give you a sense of some of the changes, the practical changes that we've made around service delivery. So firstly, uh, for this first issue, uh, there were three, three facts or symptoms that we observed, uh, higher than benchmark unit costs, uh, particularly some challenges around non-chargeable travel, 
uh, clients not wanting necessarily or not able to see uh, uh, our team in their own home, and many of our clients uh, that were accessing block funded government services having limited travel options. So the, uh, the innovation that we've put into place is to get closer to our customers through the establishment of a suite of community clinics. And you know, Glenn, Glenn also talked about that really relevant example. You need to be where the customer is and you need to do that in a way that's, that's efficient and sustainable and actually saying, well, actually we can find a way to, to work with customers in their communities in a way in which they want to access services. Everyone wins. Uh, through that. Uh, the second issue that, we, that we've worked through uh, has been around uh, cancellations and no-shows. Um, it impacts the, um, the services that clients receive and also the productivity of our team. Uh, and for our clients, uh, to that point, there's generally been no consequence uh, as a block-funded service. So understanding that, what we've done is to really develop a new attendance policy to proactively encourage, encourage attendance. And some of that is, again, not revolutionary, uh, actually just letting people know when their appointment is so uh, that they're reminded of it and can talk with us earlier if it needs to change. And then if there is sustained on attendance, then we can manage that reactively in a way that's sensitive and appropriate to the circumstances uh, of that particular family. And then thirdly, uh, we found that making the change to the front line really required to give, giving our people uh, the information they needed to help manage their own performance uh, uh, as well. So for Montrose, uh, our team wasn't receiving regular information around the work that they were doing. Uh, how billable were they? They didn't know that. Uh, in some cases, performance expectations weren't clear. And Montrose has had a long a historic wait list. You know, you were lucky to get a service at, at Montrose and, and many other organisations because there may have been a six month waiting list. So we've worked very hard to develop systems and processes to actually give our team the information that they need so that they can help self-regulate themselves. And I think uh, we've been terribly impressed by the way in which when presented with information, uh, many, so many of our team members have responded appropriately to uh, uh, to lift their performance and, and workload where that was needed to be done. Finally, uh, I'll run through some key lessons learned. Uh, probably five things, they're on the screen. Uh, getting the issues properly diagnosed was really important for us, so make sure that we really understood that. Get the evidence to make sure that uh, what we thought we was, thought was happening was happening. Really get the focus on the customer, and that's probably a, a point that I would repeat again and again and again. Acknowledging change is really, really hard and don't be, don't be afraid to experiment uh, and if you fail, fail fast and try the next experiment. Thanks so much for your time.